We're talking in these 10 days about the way Islam helps to take care of us psychologically, emotionally, how Islam takes care of our feelings. And we were talking yesterday about how Islam tells us to take care of other people. And we mentioned that when we take care of other people, it also takes care of ourselves, it also helps us. We got so far as to looking at who we have a duty to take care of, who we have to take care of. And who did we say? We said first, and the most important, our parents. We have to take care of our parents. They might not always show it, they might not always tell us, but there will be times where your parents are struggling. There will be times where your parents, they need your support, they need your help. So we have to take care of our parents. Who else? Our brothers, our sisters, our family our cousins, aunties, uncles, those people who are related to us and are, are our family, we have to take care of them. We mentioned three rights that we have over our brothers, or over our siblings, our brothers and sisters. And what did we say? That your brother should be your support. They should be there to make you stronger. The second thing we said is they should be, they should defend you against your enemies. And the third thing we said is that they should bring you towards the right path, the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third, we mentioned our friends. Our friends are also very important. It's important to have good friends, friends who will take care of us. Why? We mentioned the hadith of Imam Ali salam, where he says that you should have as many friends as possible, as many true friends as possible, for they are what? They are your suppliers in joy and your shelter in distress. He tells us that when our friends are happy, we will be happy. So we should have as many true friends as possible. And when our friends are, and when we are sad, our friends will take care of us. They will help us. So we should have as many true friends as possible. And the last thing we mentioned was our community, the people around us. And we, through these majalis, are very lucky to have a very strong community. We have something that a lot of people don't. A lot of people have their school friends. They have their work friends. A lot of people, the friends love their football, so I have friends from football. I go to Arsenal matches, so I have friends who I see at the Arsenal matches. But I also have the friends I make at the, at the mosque. The friends I made here in al Qaim growing up, in the Dari Jafia when I was growing up in South London. The friends we have from these Majali Sezar, from these lectures, when we come together, those are a blessing that we've been given. And it's a blessing that not everybody receives, so we have to remember to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. We have to remember to take care of those friends that we gain through the community, the people that we see around us every day in mosque, every week at Jummah. That community is a very strong one. Alhamdulillah, like I said yesterday, I've been coming to al Qaim from the very beginning when it was a small house. And every single year that I've come here, I've seen the community grow bigger and grow stronger. Every time I come here, I see new faces. But we have to make sure that when a new face comes to al Qaim, that a new, when a new person or a new family joins al Qaim, we take care of them. We bring them into the community as though they've been here right from the start. This is where we reached yesterday, looking at who we have to take care of. Now comes the important bit. How do we take care of people? How do we take care of those around us? We'll look at these things today. A, how we should take care of people. And B, we said that Islam, or we said that helping people, taking care of others, helps us as well. So how does it do that? We'll look at this as well. So before we begin, recite Salah Salawat Allah, Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So how do we take care of others? How can we help other people? <coughs> now you see, when I want to seek help from somebody, when I want somebody to help me, there's three things that I need to look for. Of those three things, if any one of them is missing, then I cannot get the proper help I need from that particular person. Besides Allah, Allah. 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 One more salwa. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. 
<laughs> so, as we were saying, if I want help from somebody, I need to look for three things in that person. First, they need to know how to help me. Second, they need to be able to help me. And third, they need to want to help me. Now, why are these three things important? And why is it that if just one of them is missing, then that person who's trying to help me will not be able to? Now, the three things are very clear. Knowledge, ability, and willingness. So when I look for somebody, for instance, if I've got a jar of pickles, I want to open a jar of pickles. I ask Zane. I said to Zane, can you help me open a jar of pickles? Now if Zane has the ability to open a jar of pickles, he's strong enough, and he wants me to open a jar of pickles, he wants me to be able to eat the pickles inside, or he wants them himself, but he doesn't know how to open the jar, then he can't help me, because he doesn't know how to help me. The second option, the second scenario, Zane knows how to open the jar, he knows you twist it, and he wants to help me as well. He wants to open the jar of pickles for me, but he's not strong enough, he can't do it. Then Zane can't help me. And the third example, if Zane knows how to, he knows that you have to twist the jar to open it, and he's strong enough to get the jar open, but for some reason or another, Zane doesn't want me to get to the pickles inside, then Zane doesn't want to help me, and so he will not. So we have to look at these three things. We have to look for all three things in somebody we look for, helping. They have to be able to help us, they have to know how to help us, and they have to want to help us. The first and most important thing about caring for somebody is to want to care for them, to want to help them, to want to take care of them. When Imam Ali salam says to us, and the hadith we mentioned yesterday, I'll repeat it again, that have as many true friends as possible, for they are your suppliers in joy and your shelter in distress. This second bit, they're your suppliers in joy and your shelter in distress. We said yesterday that it means when your friend is happy, you will be happy as well. And when you are upset or when you are going through something difficult, your friend will also be upset or your friend will also be unhappy. In the same way, when you truly care for somebody, when you really care for somebody, when they are happy, you will be happy. When they are upset, you will be upset. You care about what they care about. You care about how they are feeling. This is how we should be when we try to care for somebody. When we want to help somebody and take care of them, especially when we're dealing with their emotions and their feelings, we have to make sure that what we do is out of true love for them, that we truly care about them, we genuinely want what is best for them. This is why we say that the first person we turn to is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? The three things, to know, to be able to, and to want to help the person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. He knows how to help us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability. He is powerful over all things. So he has the ability to help us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his creation. He's al-Rahman, he's al-Rahim. He wants the best for us. He wants to help us. So we turn first to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do we have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? All these people that we mentioned, our family, our friends, our community, our parents. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Now, the important thing of wanting to care for somebody. The important thing of wanting to take care of them. We have that. We truly want to care for our friend. We truly want to help them when they're struggling with something. Now what was next? Knowledge, the understanding, the capability. Now in this kind of help, there's two types of knowledge. There's the knowledge theoretically and the knowledge practically. The practical knowledge is what we call the ability. How we help them, can we help them? So the how is to know what to do. And can we help them? That's down to us. Each and every one of us, if we have a loving heart, if we have a caring heart, then we can help. If we have an open mind, then we can help. We all have the ability within ourselves to help those around us. But the knowledge, how do we help the people around us? How do we take care of them? This is the important part. And often, it's something that can be quite difficult. Because for each individual person, what they need, the help they require, can be different. The things they're struggling with might be different. And the way we all see different issues is different as well. The way we all see different things can be different as well. Now, for instance, one example, 
And this is talking about something physical. If, for instance, you guys were to look up at that clock, the guys here in the front row, they would look at the clock, but they can't see the hands because the light's shining on it. Over it. From here, I can see the hands shining on it. And for the guys sitting at the back, you can see the hands on the clock. But from here, if these guys sitting at the front were to look at that same clock, they're going to see the glare of the light. Each of us looks at something and sees something different. That clock is a physical thing, it's there. But each person here looks at it and sees something different. Now when we are seeing non-physical things, when we're looking at our emotions, our feelings, which are much more complicated, they're much more liquid, they're much more, there's much more room for them to be seen differently. Each and every person can see each and everything very, very differently, from a very different perspective. So we have to be very careful when we're trying to help somebody. And this is where the knowledge part really becomes important. You have to know more than just how to help the person. You have to know the person you're helping as well. Know what they're struggling with, know what they're going through. <coughs> and this is the first thing that we have to know. This is the first way of helping. So we said, first of all, we have to want to help. And now, knowing what they're going through, knowing how to help. The first thing, and it is very important, is attentiveness. Pay attention. Mama. Now there's two types of attentiveness. There's two types of, there's two ways that we can pay attention. The first is to listen. And the second is to watching. These are two ways that we can pay attention. Arguably, watching is the more effective of the two. But listening first. We'll look at listening. <coughs> when we pay attention to what we're saying, there's often two ways two things that we think of when we think of listening. There's listening and then there's hearing. For instance, you guys sitting here today, if you're paying attention, you're listening to me. If you're not paying attention, if you're thinking about something different and my voice is off there in the background, then you're hearing. The noise is there, the sound is there, but you're not paying attention to what's being said. For instance, when you go to Sainsbury's and they've got the radio playing in the background, you go to a little coffee shop, they've got the radio playing in the background, you hear it, but you're not listening to it. You're not paying too much attention to the radio in the background. In the same way, when somebody's talking to us about what they're going through, about their feelings or their emotions, or even in general conversation, when we're talking about anything and everything, you could be talking about the football, you could talk about the Arsenal match, talk about the Chelsea match, you could be talking about what you did over the weekend, you could be talking about anything, but listen. And pay attention when you listen. See, when you listen, there's one thing to listen in order to reply, and there's one thing to listen in order to understand. If I'm listening so that I can reply, while the person's talking, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to say next. I'm already thinking about what I want to say in response to what they've said. And we all have friends like that. We all know people like that. I have a friend who... I remember I once came in on crutches. I hurt my ankle playing football. I came into school on crutches and immediately he was ready to tell the whole school about how he once hurt his ankle, how he once hurt his ankle. I remember when anybody would get good grades in our class, he was ready to tell everyone how he helped them. He was always ready to say something. He was always there waiting to say what he wanted to say. And then there were other people who would listen. And when they would listen to what you would say, I have a friend, whenever you speak to him, once you're done talking, he takes a second. He doesn't reply straight away. He takes a second, he stops, he processes everything you've said. And you can tell he's really thinking about what's been said to him. He's really thinking about what you told him. Listen to understand. When you listen, wait until the person has finished speaking. Understand everything they have said, and then give a response. Of course, in a conversation, if I were to speak to you, and you're listening to understand, but then you don't reply to me at the end of it, and I'll feel quite annoyed that you didn't reply to me. You have to respond at some point. This is a two-way conversation, it's how conversations work, but your response should come after you've understood what is being said, not after you've heard. So the first thing when we're listening, when we're being attentive, is listen in order to understand. Listen and think about what's being said. The second, very important, it's a small little detail, a bit of practical advice. When we talk, we often mention little things, little details that don't matter to anybody. 
I might say something that to me it doesn't really matter. But if you were to then remember one of those little details, if you were then to take grasp of one of those little things that I've mentioned, and at some point in the future you mention that again, to me that is a sign that you care, that you pay attention to what I'm saying, to what I'm thinking, and that you know me on a more intimate level, on a more close level than that of other people. Now all of my friends know I'm an Arsenal fan. But one thing that I rarely ever mention is my first ever Arsenal game, Arsenal versus Sunderland at the Emirates. And I still remember to this day, there was an Arsenal fixture coming up. It was Arsenal against Sunderland again. And my friend, he mentioned to me, he was like, oh, that was your first ever football match, wasn't it? The first match you ever went to. And to him, it meant nothing that he said to me. It's just a little thing that he remembered about me. But for me, I genuinely thought, I didn't even remember telling him that. I didn't even remember mentioning it. And it's something that barely anyone would know about me barely anything you would remember about me. But he knows. He remembers. It's something about me that he knows that other people don't. It made me think he really does care. When I talk, he really does listen. He takes in right down to these small little details. So when we take note of these little details, these little things that people are saying, we can really start to build a relationship with him. We grow closer with him. And what it also helps us to do is listen between the lines. Now we know what reading between the lines is. We've all studied English literature, we've all had to go through all of that. We all know how to read what isn't written. And this is a very important thing in Islam as well. Islam gives a lot of emphasis to what we don't do, just as much as it does to what we do. It also gives a lot of emphasis to what we don't say, just as much as to what we do say. You've all heard the saying that a person who in the face of oppression he stays silent is as bad as the oppressor himself. Why? Because at this point we're giving what is known as silent approval. Me not saying anything is saying something in itself. So when we start to pick up on these little details, these little things that people are saying, it builds our skills to look at what they're not saying. It also helps us to understand the very small things that are hidden in what they're saying. This is attentiveness through listening listening to what they are saying and what they are not saying. Now it might be that somebody is talking to you about their problems and their issues and how they're feeling and at that point what you listen to is very important. But it's also important to listen to the little things that they say that aren't about their feelings, aren't about their emotions because that's where this comes important. That's where this becomes very important. Listening to what they're not saying or listening to how they say something, listening to how they talk, how they act. Now the second way of being attentive we said was watching. The thing with watching is, and the reason I say that, it can possibly be more important than listening, is because the mind, we cannot really tell, we cannot really see the mind acting, doing its work. For instance, with gravity. Can we see gravity? No, we can't. But if I take an apple and drop it, I can see the apple dropping because of gravity. I can't see gravity itself, but I can see its effect. In the same way, when we're talking about the mind, our thoughts and our feelings, I can't see what you're thinking. I can't see what you're feeling. But the same way I can see the apple falling, I can see the way you're behaving. I can see the way you're acting. So for instance, if somebody were to yawn or if somebody were to put their head on their hand like this, I might think maybe they're getting tired. If I were to see somebody sitting upright, looking like they're interested, then I would think they're engaged. They know what I'm talking about. Our behavior tells us, or the behavior of other people tells us what is going through their mind. It can be a good indicator. It's not always correct. Like we said on the first day, somebody could have the biggest smile and they could still be upset inside. But it's not a bad choice. It's the best thing we've got to understand how somebody's feeling, what somebody might be going through. So if we were to see, for instance, our friend who's always very chatty, they're always talking, they're always happy, all of a sudden when we're out together, they've gone quiet, they're not saying much. All of a sudden, they've dropped back into the shadows, they're not really talking, they're not really as chatty, they're not really as energetic as they normally are. It's something that we might not pick up their behaviours change, their attitudes change. Or for instance, 
one thing with me and my friends, we used to go out a lot. Before I moved to Iran, we'd go out a lot. Okay. We'd go to a coffee shop. We'd go, maybe we'd go to an Arsenal game together. We'd go to different matches. The other day I went to Stanford Bridge with my friend. We used to go to matches together. <coughs> we'd go out, you know, at the library, we might go to the park, we might go to football. And we'd go out a lot. Three, four, five times a week we'd be out. One of my friends, at one point, stopped coming out with us. He had excuses, he had different reasons. First month, he'd tell us, I've got guests over, my little brother's home alone, I'm just feeling tired, I don't want to come out today. First month, we thought, fair enough, he has reasons. The second month, we started to see he still hasn't come out. It's been about two months we hadn't seen him. We started to think, maybe he's upset with us. Maybe something happened that he was upset about. So we called him and we said, is everything okay? Are you upset with us? Is there something the matter? And he was like, no, there's nothing the matter. It's just, I've been busy. I thought, okay, he's been busy, fair enough. The exams were coming up, we thought, maybe he doesn't want to come out as much, he wants to revise, he wants to study, whatever it might be. <laughs> then the third month went by and we hadn't seen him at all again. At this point we thought, now we have to go and check on him. Now, three months have gone by, we haven't seen him once. We've gone from meeting each other three, four, five times a week to three months without seeing him at all. So we went to his house, knocked on the door, and we found out he'd been suffering from what we call clinical isolation, loneliness. And we wish we'd gone to his house sooner, because he'd been in and out of hospital in those three months. His health had gone worse in those three months. But it was us noticing, albeit a little late, but us noticing that he wasn't coming out. His change in his behavior. He didn't want to come out into social situations anymore. And when we noticed that and we went, then we were able to help. When we pay attention, when we look around us, see, see the way people are behaving, see the way they're acting, that's when we can start to understand what they might be feeling, what they might be going through. In the same way, we look for things like whether they're focused. Somebody who's often looking lost, they're looking confused, they seem distracted, when before they used to be sharp, they used to be on point, they used to be on job. If we see that now they're looking distracted, they're looking lost, then it might be a cause for us to think, is he okay? Is there something else? Now I have a friend who from the first day I've met him, he's always seemed distracted, he's always seemed lost. He's always seemed a little dopey. For him, I wouldn't be so concerned. But then my friends who are normally very sharp, they seem very focused. If they were to become distracted, then it might be a cause for concern. Then it might be a reason that I might ask them, are you okay? Is everything okay? Is everything all right? Seeing how they behave, are they different from usual in one way or another? You guys know your friends best. You guys know how your friends behave. You can tell them, or you can see for yourselves, when your friend starts to behave differently. And it's very easy when our friends start to behave differently for us to ignore it. Just to think, oh, you know, Maybe something's up, or maybe he's changing, he's growing. Maybe that could be the cause. It's very easy to ignore it. But even still, even if it is just something that's happened, just something normal, they've grown up, they've changed. Even if it is something like that, it doesn't hurt to ask. It doesn't hurt to check up on it. It's our attentiveness. Being attentive, looking out for other people. Looking out at how they're behaving. What their behaviours are like. And now we come on to actually help. See, being attentive, it helps us identify problems. It helps us build a relationship with a person. But now it comes to the point where we actually help, where we actually try to take care of them. And again, there's two ways. There's helping people verbally, through our words. And this is very important when we're dealing with emotions, when we're dealing with feelings. Why? When we're dealing with feelings and emotions, often when we keep them within ourselves, when we keep them in our head or keep them in our heart, they build up. Our mind starts to talk to us and tell us things, or tell us about things that aren't really there. For instance, if I'm stressing about my exams, my mind might start talking to me and telling me, oh, if you don't, you're not going to do well in your exams. You're going to fail your exams. My mind starts putting these thoughts into it. Into my heart. I start to think these things. 
And then when I start to these, think these things, then I think, oh, but how will my parents react? They'll be angry. They'll be upset with me. All of my friends, they won't look at me the same way. They'll think this of me and they'll think that of me. And these problems, one by one, build up and up and up. When in fact, the real issue was I was worried about my exams. I was worried about the stress of my studies. When we talk, when we verbalize something, it helps us to separate what's real and what's not. The things we're really worried about, the things we're really stressing about, and the things that our mind has told us to stress about. The things that our feelings and our emotions have added on, that aren't necessarily there, that aren't really an issue. We have to look at what really is a problem, what really does make us struggle, what we really are worried about, and things that have been added on. The little things that aren't really there, the problems that aren't really in existence, but we fear for them, we're worried about them. These are the things we have to look at, and when we speak about something, it makes it a lot more real. It makes it a lot more true. So once I've said it out loud, then I can separate what's really worrying me and what my mind or my heart has added on, what my feelings and emotions have added on. But when we verbalize these things, we have to understand the importance of our words. Right now, we're looking at it as the person who's trying to help somebody else. So we have to look at the importance of what our words can do. See, our, ver our words are very important. What we say can have a massive impact. And we don't always realize it. We don't always realize how important what somebody says to us might be, or what we may say <coughs> to somebody else might be. See, our words, and there's a phrase that we learn when we're younger. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but nothing you say will hurt. And sticks and stones can break your bones, but the hurt that you can feel when somebody says something to you, it can be bad. We have to teach ourselves to be strong. We have to teach ourselves to know what things to take seriously. To know what things to let hurt us. If you want to know about how words can affect somebody, look at these majorities. The Messiah of Imam Hussein alayhi We all know what happened. We all know the tragedy of Karamala. But when, when the Mulana starts reciting the tragedy, when he starts talking about it, that's when people start crying. And you'll notice when you're sitting in the Majlis upstairs especially, the Mulana only has to say a few words and people will be crying. The people sitting there will be upset. Their hearts will be heavy. <coughs> it's the power of words. See, we have sticks and stones. They deal with the physical world. world. But our words... They deal with our feelings, our emotions. Our words can be very important, and how we use them as well. The very first thing we do when we verbalize, the very first thing we have to do when we check, or when we try to help somebody, is tell them you're there. Tell them you're there to help. Often we kind of just assume. We kind of just think, well, my friends know they can talk to me. They know they can come to me for help. Now, see, with my friends, me and my friend, we didn't really used to talk much. We used to go out, we used to have fun, make jokes, we'd go play football. Like I said, we'd go to the matches together, we'd go out. But we didn't really have that <coughs> talking kind of thing. We would just kind of assume if anybody has a problem, they can talk to us about it. And then one day, I'll be honest, I can't really remember how it came about, but one day we started talking. We started talking and we realized that each and every one of my friends they had something that they were struggling with, something they were going through. And it was something that the rest of us could help them with. Something that we could help them to get out of, a struggle, an issue that we could help them to get out of. But because up until that point, nobody had ever verbalized that we can talk to each other. Nobody had ever made it clear that we can talk to each other, that we are there for each other. Even though we were, we all knew that if any of our friends wanted to talk to me, they can talk to me. If I want to talk to any of them, I can talk to them. But nobody ever said it. And when it was said, we realized that each and every one of those guys was going through something or other. They were dealing with something or other. So it's important to verbalize what you're, what you're thinking. It's important to verbalize the fact that you're there for them. It might be something simple, it might be something little. But make sure you do it. Take that step. And it's often very easy to think, 
that if I say something to say, say to somebody that I'm there for you, it's easy to think that if I have a friend who I'm there for, who I'm happy to take care of, that then they'll be there for me, or that they'll accept my help. One thing to remember is when you make yourself available to help someone, they won't always take that help. But don't be upset. Don't be disheartened. If you offer somebody your help, you shouldn't always be upset when they don't take that help. It's like in football. If I'm running towards goal, for instance, the Liverpool match, just by a show of hands, how many of you guys have watched football? Okay, so I'll go ahead and do that. Liverpool over the weekend, and I know Salah has a lot of Liverpool supporters. Liverpool over the weekend, when they played, there was a moment where Salah could have passed to Sadio Mane. He didn't. He cuts in, he goes for the shot, the shot gets blocked or is missed. And Sadio Mane was very, very angry. I'm sure you all saw it. On the sidelines, he was shouting at the opening block. He was very annoyed that he didn't receive the pass. He was there. He was available for Salah to take his help, but Salah chose not to. Mane got very angry, very annoyed. It's easy to see when I make myself available to somebody, when I tell somebody I'm there to help them, and they don't take that help. It's easy to become annoyed. It's easy to think I was trying to do something nice for them, and they didn't care about it. They didn't want to take it. But not everybody will take that help from me, and that's all right. It's something we shouldn't get upset about something we shouldn't get angry about. Now when we verbalize it, a conversation might ensue. We might start talking about the problems we have, if they accept that help. And at this point, it's very important to watch how we respond. To be careful of how we respond to the problems that somebody tells us about, <coughs> the things that they talk to us about. One thing that's very easy to do is to accidentally be dismissive to accidentally make somebody feel like their problems aren't important. And a small example, a very easy one. If somebody smart is worrying about their exams, they're very smart, they always get the best grades, they're worried about their exams, and they say to you that they're worried about it, and you tell them, oh, don't worry about it, you'll be fine. To you, you're just reassuring them, you're telling them, don't worry, you'll be fine. But to them, there's something that really is worrying them, something that's on their mind, and after you've made yourself available to help them, you've then turned around and said that their problem isn't a big one. Their problem isn't worth worrying about. Now when we do these things, when we say something like that, we're trying to help. We have the best intention. We want what's best for them. But to them, it might seem upsetting. To them, it might seem like we don't care. So it's important to stay supportive, rather than be dismissive. Everything we say should be to help that person, to support them in a way where we understand what they're going through and give them solutions, rather than tell them that their problem isn't one that they need to be worrying about. Now, like I said, we all know our friends. We all know what they go through, how they think, how they feel. Our closest friends, we understand what will help them, what won't help them. These are just a few small points, a few small things that we have to take on board when trying to help other people. We don't have a lot of time, so I'll start to mention the last point that we said. We said that taking care of others helps ourselves. Islam tell, tells us to help take care of others, to help others. How does that help me? How does that work for me? Like I said, when me and my friends started talking about our problems, about the things that we were going through, we realized that we were all going through something that each other can help with. A few of my friends were all going through the same issues, the same problems. And when we opened up about it, when my friends started talking about their issues, they realized that there are other people going through the same struggles. They're not alone in those struggles, they're not alone in those problems. They gained the support, a network. And this, this network is very important, our support systems are very important. We'll look at that in a lot of depth over the coming days. This is one thing, realizing that you're not alone. The problems you're going through, things that are worrying you, stressing you out, annoying you even, that happens to other people as well. And the second thing, it's a lot easier to give advice than it is to use your own advice. So for instance, how many of you guys have actually been to a football match in a stadium? Not a lot. How many of you guys watch football on TV? When you're watching football on TV, you can see every pass that's possible. You can see the options that the player on the ball has. 
you can see what is best for them to do next. How many of you guys actually play football? Quite a few. See, when you're in the game, when you're in the match, you can't see all those things that somebody from outside can see. You can't see everything that somebody who's looking at you from outside of the match can see. Now, it's a lot easier to give advice from outside of a situation than to actually be inside that situation and make the right decision. It's a lot easier to look at something from the outside and say, this is what you need to do, than it is to be in that situation, to be in that moment. So when you give advice to somebody else, you might find that that advice that you're giving to somebody else from an outsider's perspective also can apply to you. It can also help you with something you're struggling with. It can also help you with the situation you're in. It can also be something that builds that support system, like we said. Now, when we see the blessing that we've been given, and this is something we'll look at in more depth over the coming days as well, we see the blessings that we've been given in the support system. When we look at this community, like we spoke about earlier. And everybody in this community is here for one thing today. We're here to remember Imam Hussein Lays. We're here to remember the tragedy of Karbala. But you see, like we said, each person looks at something different. And in the same way, when we think of Imam Hussein, each person thinks of something different. Somebody might remember Imam Hussein as a child running through the streets of Medina with Prophet Muhammad. Somebody might remember Imam Hussein as the brother of Hazrat Abbas. Somebody might remember them as the father of Bibi Sakina. Every thinks of something different when they think of Imam Hussein. But one of the most upsetting and tragic ways to remember Imam Hussein is the way that the Imam of our time, Imam Muhammad al Mahdi, Ajal Allah, Ta'ala, Faraj al Shalameed, the way the Imam of our time remembers his grandfather, Ziyad Dinah. In Ziyad Dinah, here he calls out, he says, I send my salams, he says, I send my salams upon him whose right ribs were crushed until they fell into his left ribs whose left ribs were crushed until they fell into his right ribs. He said, I send my salams upon my grandfather, who on the morning of the 10th of Muharram, his beard was white, and by the time of Asr, his beard was red with the blood. He says, I send my salams on the severed neck of Hussein. I send my salams on the head upon the spears. This is how my Imam remembers his grandfather. Yesterday, our Messiah reached the point where Imam Hussain has taken the caravan and he is beginning his journey. As the caravan starts to move away from Medina, the people along that caravan, the people traveling with Imam Hussain, the women, the children, the men, the boys, they constantly turn back and look towards their houses, look back towards the city where they grew up. They look at the doors of each and every one of their houses. And as they look back towards the house of Imam Hussein, they see Bibi Fatima Sura standing there, watching as her family all leave. At one point, the patience of Bibi Fatima Sura breaks. She begins to run towards the horses. She begins to run towards the caravan of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein says, Hazrat Abbas, Abbas, stop the caravan. Let me go back and say goodbye to my daughter one last time. Imam Hussein, he is an Imam. He will give up everything, but remember, he is a father as well. Bibi Fatima Sohra is his daughter. He goes back one last time. He holds Bibi Fatima Sohra. He says goodbye to her one last time and then they set off. Mawla Hussain mounts Zul Janah. This Zul Janah has a very special relationship with Imam Hussain. This relationship started in Imam Hussain's childhood where he comes into the courtyard of Masjid Nabawi one day. Zul Janah is stood by a wall. Imam Hussein says to Rasulullah that I want to ride that horse. That horse standing there, I want to ride that horse. Rasulullah says to Imam Hussein, Hussein, this is a war horse. It does not allow other people to ride it. Imam Hussein says, Ya Rasulullah, I want, to, I want to ride this horse. He says to his grandfather, I have a wish to ride that horse. Rasulullah takes Imam Hussein by the hand. He starts to walk over to Zuljanah. What did Rasulullah say? 
He said, Sunjana does not allow other people to ride him. He does not allow anybody else to mount him. But what does Rasulullah see? As Imam Hussein walks towards Zuljana, Zuljana bends his neck down. He bends his legs so Imam Hussein can get up easily. Rasulullah picks up Imam Hussein. He puts him on the, on the back of Zuljana. Imam Hussein is sitting on the back of his horse. Rasulullah takes a few steps back. He looks at his grandson. He looks at Zuljana and he smiles. And then all of a sudden, Rasulullah begins to cry. His companions ask him, Ya Rasulullah, why do you cry? What is the reason for your tears? Hussein is having fun, he is enjoying himself. Rasulullah turns to his companions and he says, It will be the same Hussein. It will be the same Zuljana, but it will not be Medina. Hussein will be alone in Karbala. I am remembering the time where Hussein will fall from this very Zuljana, but he will never reach the ground of Medina. He will never reach the floor of Karbala. This same Zuljana is with Imam Hussein as he leaves Medina today. He's with Imam Hussein as he leaves Medina. As he leaves Fatima Sughra behind, they go on their travels. As they are traveling, many months have passed. There comes a time where Zuljana stops, where Zuljana refuses to move any further. Imam Hussein, he ushers Zuljana to move forward, but Zuljana does not. If you look at the life of Imam Hussein and his relationship with Zuljana, there are only two times where you'll find Zuljana refused to move forward when told to by Imam Hussein. One is here along the journey towards Karbala, and one is on the 10th of Muharram as Imam Hussein starts to ride out towards the battlefield when baby Sakina grabs the legs of Zuljana and cries out to him, Zuljana, do not make me an orphan today. Do not take my father into the battlefield, Zuljana. Here Zuljana has stopped on the journey of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein gets off his horse. In, upon the back of her camel, Sayyidah Zainab summons Hazrat Abbas. Hazrat Abbas comes to Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab says to him, Abbas, tell my brother Hussein we must leave this land soon. Tell my brother Hussein I do not wish to stay here. I do not wish to stop here. Why have we stopped? Well, Abbas asks her, why do you wish to leave this land? We have stopped because Zuljana will not move. Why do you say we must leave quickly? She says, Abbas, as soon as we entered this land, my heart felt unease. My heart started to tremble. Abbas, from the sands of this place, from the ground, I can smell the blood of my brother Hussein. Hazrat Abbas goes back to Imam Hussein. He tells him what Sayyidah Zainab has said. Imam Hussein looks at Hazrat Abbas. He says, Abbas, call a few people towards me. People of this land, call them here. They are called to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein asks them, tell me, what is the name of this land? Somebody said, Nainaba. Imam Hussein said, no, there is another name. Tell me another name. The people say, Ghazar Ya. Imam Hussein says, no, there must be another name. They keep saying names again and again and again. According to some narrations, up to 90 names were said until the men of the land said, there are no other names. There is nothing else that this land has been named. Imam Hussein Islam says, go and find the oldest of this land. The people who have been here the longest, call them. The oldest of the land are called. There is a man, he cannot walk, he is crippled. He is carried over to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein asks him, tell me, I have been told all of these names for this land, but is there any other name? The man begins to cry, he begins to weep. He says to him, Yabna Rasulullah, the grandson of Rasulullah, this land is also known as Karbala. Do not stay here, Yabna Rasulullah, do not stay in this land. This is the place where every visitor who has come here has gone through troubles. Every visitor who has come here has struggled in one way or another. Do not stop here. Imam Hussein says, no, this Karbala. This is the very land that my grandfather told me about. This is the very land that we have been searching for. He then calls all the men of the tribe of that land together. The tribe is known as Banu Asad. The men are called together to see Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein then says to them, he asks them, is this your land? Do you own this property? They say, yes, this is our land. Imam Hussein asks, what is the value of this land? They give him a price. Imam Hussein says, I wish to buy this land of you. These men were believers in Rasulullah. They say, Yabna Rasulullah, for you, there is no price. You take the land as you wish. Imam Hussein says, no. He gives four times the value of that land. He gives four times whatever that, the value was. And then he says, I'm gifting the land back to you. Keep the land and keep the money. But I have three favors to ask from you. 
I have three instructions for you. They say to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, tell us what it is you wish from us. He says, the very first thing, after some days, our bodies will be lying on the sands of Karbala. <laughs> Make sure you bury our bodies, let us not lie underneath the boiling sun. They say, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, of course, we will take care of you, we will bury you. Imam was saying the second thing he says. He says, when people come to visit my grave, tell them, tell them which grave is which, who is who. Tell them this is the grave of Ali Akbar, this is the grave of Al-Abbas, this is the grave of Hussein. For those of you who have ever been to Karbala, who have ever seen the graves, one thing you might have noticed. When you go to the grave of Hazrat Abbas, for those of you who are lucky enough to have gone some years ago when it was possible to go downstairs to see the actual grave of Hazrat Abbas, you will notice something about the grave. Hazrat Abbas was a very tall man. He was a very strong man. But if you look at his grave, his grave is only so big. The place where Hazrat Abbas is buried is so small that say, maybe Sakina could be buried there. Imam Hussein says, show the people where each of our graves are. And he says, the third request I have, if any of my visitors come to this land, if anybody comes to visit my grave, keep them here for three days as your guest. If they are hungry, give them food. If they are thirsty, give them water. I ask my Imam, oh Imam Hussein, why? Why did you say three days? Why did you specify to give them water? Why did you tell them give them food? Mawla Hussein, my reply, the pain he had when Hazrat Hur comes to Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura, when he says to Imam Hussein, I wish to go out into the battlefield. I wish to give my life. What does Imam Hussein reply to Hazrat Hur? He says, Hur, you are my guest. You have only been with me for one day. You too are thirsty. You too are hungry. You have not eaten since the morning. How can I let you go to the battlefield? Maybe Imam Hussein is remembering Hur when he tells Banu Asad to do this. When he tells them, keep them here for at least three days. Give them food, give them water. Maybe he remembers his Hazrat Hur. Imam Hussein, he then says, for all the women of the Banu Asad to be called Hur. He then says, for all of them to be called, all the women gather. Imam Hussein addresses this. He says, after some days, our bodies will be lying here on the sands of Karbala. Our bodies will be here without any kafan. There will be nobody to bury us. At that point, if the men of Banu Asad do not bury us, encourage them, tell them, make them bury us. And if they still do not bury us, if they still do not bury our bodies, then you go with the excuse of getting water from the river for us. And as you pass our bodies, just take one handful of sand and throw it at our bodies one at a time. So that our bodies eventually may be covered with the sand. The women, they all, they all agree. He then says, you may go back, but call all your children towards us. Imam Hussein calls the children. He says to them, children, after some days, me, my family, my friends, we will all be lying here. At that point, if your fathers do not bury us, and if your mothers are too scared to bury us as well, pretend you are playing out in the battlefield. Pretend you are playing, having fun and games, and as you play, just take one handful of sand and throw them towards our bodies. Take a handful of sand each and throw them over the martyrs so that our bodies are not left. Imam Hussein said three times, once to the men of Bani Asad, once to the women of Bani Asad, and once to the children. I'll take you to the 13th of Muharram, the bodies are still lying on the plains of Karbala. The women have gone to get water from the river Farad. And what do they hear? They hear a woman's crying. They hear the sound of a woman's crying and wailing. What do they hear her say? They hear her say, Ma Hussein is alone in Karbala. There has been nobody to bury him. He is left alone under the boiling sun. It is the cries of Sayyidah Zahra who cries for her son in Karbala. Who cries for her son unburied and before we go upstairs again, I'd ask the brothers to stay seated while the sisters make their way. And while they take their, make their way upstairs to the Majlis of Muhammad.